we can embrace the cause of global revival in this end time and give all that we have in order to you for its purpose in Jesus name in Jesus name amen 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 so so thankful to be in the house of the Lord and so so thankful for God's extreme goodness hallelujah if we could uh, turn to the word of the Lord and I I woke up this morning I woke up this morning intending to share a burden of mine every generation has to build its own altar and I believe that with all my heart. And uh, as I began to pray that one last time, I felt such a, uh, such a stirring and a pull in another direction. And I, I certainly want to obey the Lord. And, and uh, I, I hope to very soon share my burden about what we have to do. What we have to do to make sure that there is an altar for every generation. But if we can go to Jeremiah chapter 29... Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. Amen. I'm going to say a few things that I've said before. You know, we're blessed. I try to be repetitious intentionally. But we're blessed with an abundance of, of new people. God's been good to us over the, the nine and a half years that our family's gotten to be part of Longview First Church. And He was good long before that. We, we've seen an abundance of, of new people and several of late. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, God's been so good to us. We're going to take a, a day and talk about church history uh, because this month, or this year rather, is the 100th anniversary of the Brush Arbor meeting that brought the infilling of the Spirit as a revival to, to the city of Longview. And a lot of tremendous things have happened. And this church is a direct descendant of that. And, uh, and we're thankful for that. And uh, I was fixing to say some of you might have been here for that. But I don't think as I look around. So we're going to take a service soon and talk about that. But we're blessed today, three years ago next month, through great sacrifice and incredible amount of hard work, we moved from our old building to this one because we had outgrown it. And we've got a lot of building here, and, and, and I don't know that we'll ever quite finish it off, but this room is certainly, certainly set in its size. Now, we took our children out because even in the pandemic with all the families who are not yet participating and people quarantining, we, we, we ran out of room again. We have five rows blocked off. And during worship service, I was looking around and counting, and I came up already with 53 active members of Longview First Church that are not present today. Plus the people that are in children's ministry next door. So pretty soon, we're going to have to figure it out. Or get to know each other a lot better. <laughs> now the good news is we've got room we didn't have before. We can figure it out without selling kids and stuff, you know. And so if anybody watching or anybody here just maybe has another hundred thousand dollars you've been trying to figure out what to do with, we've got plans for that. See me after service. Amen. Good problems to have. But all the good things happening in the kingdom and all the good things happening at LFC. If you don't let them happen in your life, you're shortchanging yourself. I rejoiced and watched God work in the lives of people all week long, and I love that. And I give myself for that, but I don't ever want to reach the place where He's not working in me. So with that in mind, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. The Lord said, For I know the thoughts that I Thank toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God's letting them know while they're swallowed in Babylonian chaos. I know what I've got in mind for you. Some people here have suffered tremendous loss over the last year. And I've hurt with you and wept with most of you. But I want to tell you today, God was not surprised. 
Our nation has gone through and is going through a pandemic that at the very least has robbed me of some close friends and has impacted, I think, everyone's economy and life and lifestyle. But God was not surprised. He told His people, I know what I have in mind for you. It's good and not evil. And when it's all said and done... I'm going to give you the end that I expected the entire time. He plays the whole game and writes the entire story with a specific outcome in mind. He knows how it's going to end for you, me, and us. Before he ever picks up the pen and begins to tell the story of our life. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. So you might find yourself in quite a jam today. Domestically, spiritually, financially, emotionally, physically. But it's imperative in the midst of that chaos that you step up, step back, and look up and realize... That my predicament did not take him by surprise. And if I put myself in his hands, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. If I put myself in his hands, then my predicament suits his purpose. He has a purpose for my predicament. And it serves his purpose. And the end that is around the corner, whether I grasp it or not, he expected that from the very outset. Let's ask him to help us. God, I love you. Thank you for loving me, for loving us, for being with us. We're believing you, God, to just move in our midst to have your way in this house in Jesus name we thank you for it all in Jesus name amen let's just clap our hands to him together one more time hallelujah thank you thank you you may be seated I want to say uh, and we've done it different online we try not to call too many visitors names we have uh, returning visitors and God bless all of you and uh, gotten to, to, to meet most of you baptize a few of you we're thankful for that and God's been doing great things and uh, I don't think I could uh, I could embarrass them but we're thrilled to have uh, brother and sister Lewis with us again you know he pastored in our area it was in our section back then for many years and he's preached here before we need to do that again. I want to be as tall as him when I grow up. Amen. Or as skinny. I'll take either one. The Bible said the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I've always stressed to us, I'm going to say a few things you've heard before if you've been around here long. I've always stressed to us that that means my focus has to be on what God defines as a good man or a good woman. And then he will take care of where my steps lead me. He can guide me into his purpose if serving and knowing and pleasing him is my purpose. And with that in mind, we understand that as children of God, from the time we're called out of darkness and into his marvelous light we are set apart for his purpose we are pilgrims set apart to show his glory and his word and his truth and his ways to our world that's why Peter picked up his pen and he wrote the saints in Caesar's household salute thee another writer said the saints in Babylon greet thee and their geography did not define them and their race did not define them and their language did not define them they were Defined by their purpose. I am a saint of God. When we become children of God, our identity is supposed to shift. None of you are plumbers who are Christians, or bankers who are Christians, or air conditioner repairmen who are Christians, or bank tellers who are a Christian. No, you're a Christian who does plumbing and a Christian who works at a bank. Our identity has to first begin in Him. We are under great pressure, but we are afforded great privilege. 
privilege by a great purpose. We are chosen by God, called out by the King, separated by the Savior, set apart to be an ambassador for Him. And in the day and world and the age that we live in, our battle is, it's not like not yet, and it may get there, but it's not like that early church who the Romans fed the lions or sold into slavery or wrought destruction on in an effort to destroy the church. Our battle's different. We're more like Lot in Sodom or Obadiah in Kings. So that if we're not careful, we'll become so like our society, our corrupt, plastic, eroding society that we blend into our situation and we don't affect anything. Now there's a lot of preaching in Ezekiel 37 but I want to grab this verse number 1 the Bible said the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down. He set me down. Catch this. God picked me up. God carried me off and set me down in the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and lo there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry. Ezekiel has a spiritual moment. He's lost in the presence of God. God picks him up and carries him away but when he sets him down, he sets him down in the midst of a mess in a valley which was full of dead, dry, disjointed slaughtered bones we're in the house of the Lord this morning we're going to leave here in just a little while and some of us will go eat in groups and some will return home and some will engage in hobbies and some to see family and friends but all of us will roll out of bed in the morning and step back into the real world world where our work is where are the education system whatever the pressures of your day to day life and if we're not careful we'll get the pyramid upside down and we'll see the church as, as just a gas station where I can get enough fuel to make another mile on the journey and if I can just survive till Wednesday and if I can just survive the youth service and if I can just survive till next Sunday morning if I can just get through one more week and if you're struggling we'll pray with you and help you get through one more week but that is not our purpose here our purpose here is to have our octane level lifted our batteries recharged it's not to survive until we step again in here again it's to serve until we step in here again we want to step back into our world ready to make an impact for God's purpose now Ezekiel's in a predicament he's surrounded by death and decay and destruction and negativity all my life I've tried to stay away from negative people now COVID's here I'm trying to stay away from positive people (laughs) he's surrounded by negativity now we think in our hearts everything's wonderful I'm just going to give myself to Jesus and I'll never be in another valley God put him in one It's just going to be wonderful. I'm going to give myself to Jesus and I'll never be in another cemetery. God transported him to one. I hope you chose to be here today. But life and God will occasionally lead you into places that you never chose to go. And through seasons that you never desire to endure. Sometimes he pours his spirit out on us and we're overcome with it. We're intoxicated with it. But sometimes he drops us into the midst of an absolute upside down imaginable mess and we have to realize that it's still his purpose and when I'm in the valley I've still got to be there to shine and to operate and to minister because God's purpose may not be for me God's purpose may be for my valley I may be there to do the very thing he created me to do see we pray for God to put his hand on us But we have a specific thing in mind when we pray that. Sometimes God's hand and purpose drops us into a dysfunctional labyrinth. Surrounded by angry people and troubled people and sinful people and broken people. We can't always be on a revival mountaintop. But we can't always live in such a way that we impact our valley. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. When we say, use me, Jesus. If we're not careful, we mean in front of people under air conditioning. In a way that I'm talented to produce. Use me, Jesus. 
I want to be led of the Lord. Most people, when they say that, what they really mean is, God, I've got a place I want you to take me. I want to be like Jesus, walking on water, raising the dead, preaching to thousands, feeding the multitude. Never mind that spit in your face, pluck the beard from your cheeks, call you devil possessed, beat you until you can't stand. That's not what I meant. Sometimes he takes you into the valley. Sometimes he puts you in the predicament. Sometimes you're surrounded by death and destruction and decay. But you hear me, he will anoint you there and help you there not to survive that He'll use you right there because the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Every year I find a way to preach about this. If there's ever been a generation, it is ours, that must be delivered from escapism. Our whole world is Harry Houdini reincarnated. You can't put me in a jam I can't run away from. Escapist. When it gets tough, when it's hard, when it's frustrating, when it's fearful. I've got a friend, actually a relative, who I was laughing with one day. And they said, you know, I just want to find the right person and settle down and be happy. And I said, sweetheart, I love you. But if the last four weren't right, maybe you should start shopping on a different aisle. Because I've got bad news. When you find the right person, you're still going to have issues and seasons of trouble. It's part of life. We can't escape from it. We're a society on the prowl for ready-made situations. We're, we're, we're a society that's just looking for the set-up deal. Everything's already there. At this point, I usually pick on preachers because then you won't take that personal. You know how preachers are. You ever met one of those guys? Him, yeah, not you. Him. We, uh, I, I've been involved lately in a church that's seeking a pastor and it's a wonderful church and I know God's going to take care of all that and he's got the perfect plan in mind for them because it's his church at the end of the day but uh, you wouldn't believe and I, and I understand questions I, I ask questions and uh, we, we all do but it, it'll boggle your mind the amount of, uh, of people that are I'm seeking the will of God that's a good thing I feel a call in my life that's a good thing but you know how many youth do they have and tell me about their music and do they have any money saved what kind of bill and do they have how many kids do they have talk to me about their Sunday school teachers and there's nothing wrong with any of those questions but it doesn't have a thing in the world to do with the will of God that's not how it works I told a friend of mine 15 years ago you're looking for a perfect church but they don't need a pastor and they'd never be interested in you you are woefully imperfect it doesn't matter what kind of mess the valley's in the only question is God am I Ezekiel am Am I the one who's supposed to stand in the middle of the mess and say, Oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord? That's as true for your family. That's as true for your friend circle. You don't have to have a call to a pulpit to be used of God. He'll use us all right where we are. He has a purpose for your life. You want to know how many problems we've got in this building today? You count the eyeballs and divide by two. We're all a mess. I'm not. Yes, you are. And you're self-deceived. Elijah wasn't. God sent a chariot after him. Enoch wasn't. He walked with God and was not. For God took him. If you're still here to wear shoes, you've got problems. And before we wish everybody was like us, Lord, help us all in that case. We're different and that's good. We're different. We've got tall people who can reach stuff I can't. We've got short people who can reach stuff I can't. I'm to that place now. If I have to get on the ground, I make a list of everything I need to do while I'm there. Because I only want to get up once. Of course it's imperfect. But what's our purpose in the imperfection? I uh, was preaching a revival. We had been gone. We were evangelizing for six or nine months. And uh, uh, our pastor was kind enough. He had scheduled for us to, to come preach a revival in our home church. And, and that was fun. And, and, and man, I'm so excited. I'm walking out of his office to, to, to go to the water fountain. This was in the old days when we didn't have water in bottles. This was revolutionary. Some of you don't believe me. It was not always so in our country. 
They used to bring me water like in a cup and put it on the pulpit, you know, in a glass cup. That was free. I know some of you don't believe me, but it's true. So I'm on my way to, 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 to get water about 30 minutes before church starts. I ran into a buddy of mine. We're still friends today. I said, hey, man, how's it going? He said, terrible. I thought, I'm so glad I ran into you. So what's going on? He said, man, our church just isn't what it used to be. He said, six months ago? Can I tell you something? When you think the church has lost something, it's usually you. It's been that way for me. Boy, we're just not. No, it's usually I'm just not. He was standing there. He said, you know, you listen, do you hear anything? I said, no. He said, man, I grew up in this church. It used to be that that prayer room was so loud. You couldn't talk in the foyer before church. I said, is that all that's bothering you? He said, no. He said, wait till worship service. It used to be, man, you had to be careful getting out of your pew during worship service. Somebody would run right over you. They were wild. He said, you wait till we start. It's not going to be that way today. He said, is that all? He said, no. Man, when an evangelist was here, used to be he couldn't finish a message before people were in the altar. He said, you just wait. It's not going to be that way today. I said, is that all? He said, that, that's pretty much it. I said, I'm glad you brought it up because I've got a prescription for you. Top of the stairs, first door on the left is a prayer room. If you want it on fire, buy some matches and drag yourself up there. I said, if you're not happy with worship service, I've observed that your seat is strategically located right next to an aisle. I said, if you want somebody in the altar, you're not going to bother me. You can come down before I even start preaching. But stop looking around and cursing the darkness. Somebody's got to be a candle. What's bugging you? Fix that. Pray about that. Put your hand to that. What can you do about that? I don't know how many funeral homes I've stood in this summer. More than ever in my life. But I know that there was a particular week in Orangefield. It, it was... Uh, uh, in November, we were rebuilding after a hurricane, a devastating hurricane. And our assistant pastor, a wonderful 63-year-old man, collapsed and died of a sudden heart attack. And, and I performed seven funerals that week. And that's back when I was an expert. I was like 26 or 7. I mean, I knew everything at the time. And, you know, I had one funeral sermon when that week started and seven when it ended. But... I, it was unbelievable to me. We were in a viewing and, uh, uh, for a sweet lady that had passed away whose sister attended our church. And they had a young nephew killed in an automobile accident on his way to the viewing. One day I had a 10 a.m. funeral, a 2 p.m. funeral, and a 6 p.m. visitation in a day. And in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that chaos, while we were all mourning, we were watching God just do wonderful things in other people's lives and the morning and night came together. But I observed something. In those visitations, we would have a sweet, dear, departed soul. And if the Lord tarries, we'll all be that sweet, dear, departed soul one of these days. One day, if God tarries, they're going to roll my body into a building just like this. I mean, bigger. It'll have to be bigger than this. I'm going to have enough grandkids to fill this place up. If you're going to pray, pray big, you know. But <laughs> they'll roll my remains into a building like this. And everybody else will be alive. But all of their life won't put one ounce of breath in me. Conversely, I stood in Arlington National Cemetery looking at headstone after headstone. Nobody else is in sight. I couldn't see a living soul. And I'm surrounded by the heroic uh, uh, tombstones of heroic men and women. Uh, 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 thousands of them. But all of that death did not rob me of one ounce of life. Because the people around you cannot make you alive. Nor can they drain the life from your spirit. Jesus said the water that I give you 
you will be in you a well springing up into everlasting life. You can try to exist off of energy other people create, but you'll be miserable on Monday morning. You can let other people drag you down if you want to, but what you need, it comes from the Spirit of God, not being around you, but in you. Not around you, but upon you. Greater is he that is in me. We fight it. I preach about it once a year. The magic land of elsewhere. Happiness is not something you find. Happiness is something you create. The magic land of elsewhere. I've got a friend who lives in California. I'm praying for him. Perfect climate. Right next to everything. Absolutely miserable. Begging God to let him come back to Texas. I've told you this before, but it's a true story. My my wife and I were with my parents on their 40th anniversary. 45th. It was a big one. Mom said, I want to go to Hawaii. I said, I bet you do. She said, I don't think your dad will go. Will y'all come with me if I buy tickets? I said, let me pray about yes. <laughs> yes, we will. And, and so we, we, we went to Hawaii. Some of you might remember that. And we were with my mom and dad. And, um, you know, we, we walked down to the concierge one time because I think Pop wanted to, 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 to go on a sailing trip around this, this huge rock coast. You couldn't get there any other way. And, you know, he's wanting to do all this stuff. And, and, uh, and so we walked down, and there's this energetic woman, sweet lady, who's running the concierge desk. And so this is what we're looking for. She said, I can help you. She said, where are you from? I said, Texas. She said, oh, I wish I lived in Texas. said, really? She said, yeah. She said, this place gets old. There's beaches and mountains and beaches and mountains and beaches, but that's all we got. I said, you poor thing. <laughs> she said, it's never, it never gets below 70 and it never gets above 88. It's the same weather every day. I said, I hate you. She said, if you want to take a real vacation here, who'd want to take a vacation if you live there? If you want to take a vacation here, you've got to save up and go to Australia or Japan or America. You know, the mainland. She said, I've never seen snow. I said, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you want to live? She said, Colorado. This is a true story. I called my sister who lives in cold, frozenville, ski town, awful Colorado. Oh, Colorado's gorgeous because you've never had to live there in the winter time. She had it was like twenty-five below in mid-October at her house. She had snow on July of this year. You think you like snow? I called my sister. I said, "What's going on?" She said, "Living the dream." I said, "There's a lady here you need to meet." And I listened to them tell each other how stupid they were. Both of them, I give my left arm to live where you live. It's freezing here all the time. 20 hours away from water. I wish I was in Hawaii. And this lady's, I've never seen a snowflake. And I just, I just, I just. And I sit there listening to them and I realize it doesn't matter where you go. Right now there's an Eskimo staring across the horizon wishing he was on an island. It doesn't matter where you go. And and, and Lord, help them in this room right now. If we're not careful, there'll be people thinking if I had only married and if I only did their job and if I only lived in that house and if I could just... And you think you're going to find happiness. It's never going to be located. Brothers and sisters, it is generated. And it starts with the Spirit of God inside of you working out of you into your life. You don't locate it. I say it all the time, once a year. Here it is again. The eyes of the fool, the Bible says, are on the ends of the earth. Never where they live, but always where they wish they lived. 
Never what they're doing. But always upon what they wish they could do. I listened to a, a musician being interviewed, rock star, big man, big stuff, big money. Uh, and, and he talked about the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, one of the biggest hits he had ever written and his band did it. And it was a gigantic song. And he said, and we were playing Madison Square Garden and I was in New York. And, and I found myself just weeping, wishing that I could be home with my wife. And all I could think about, all I could think about was, was how this life I'm living keeps me away from her 250 days a year and all this money won't mean anything if we don't save our marriage and half the guys in the band are, are, are drinking and drugging themselves to death because they're as unhappy as I am and then he stepped out in front of those 30,000 people who all wish they were him because that's how we're programmed the magic land of elsewhere we had a sweet friend who was our youth pastor for a time at another church. And back then, some years ago, 12 years ago, his mother had been married 13 times. And she was convinced that happiness was right around the corner. Right around the corner. Let me say it again. You're not going to find happiness. You've got to build that. Going to help you? We're never going to find revival. That's something we build. You build a Bible study staff. You build a choir. You build a youth group. You build an outreach team. You build a children's ministry. You build a friend group. We build our lives. I know what time it is. We've got to stop. We're not going to get there. But you listen to me. We have to understand that all through the word of God, God allows good godly people to wander into horrendous circumstances. And it's not so that he can bless them. And it's not to punish them. And it's not to curse them. It's so he can use them. How many times we preach about 2 Kings chapter 5 when there's this sweet godly girl, a Jewish maid. She's done everything right. She's kept the law. She goes to the synagogue. She observes the entire Hebrew law. She is a godly young woman. And the Assyrians invade Israel. And they take her as a slave and pull her away from her mom and dad and take her all the way back to the capital of Assyria where she serves the wife and family of Naaman who was a leprous man. He was the general, the most feared man in the Middle East at that time who led the Assyrians. Syrian host and now she's working for the people that have ransacked her nation and her city no idea what became of her family no idea if her house was burned or not no idea what became of her siblings but now here she is a sweet godly woman she no longer owns her own skin and there she looks at Naaman the leper and we would all say where is God in this I don't deserve this. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I live for God. I don't do anything terrible. And now my car breaks down. Now I lose my job. How can I do everything right? And my family goes so wrong. I, I don't understand. She didn't do that at all. She could have been hateful and we would have all understood. But she decided to be helpful. This woman looked at him. See, here's how God sees the story. He's got a man he can heal and he can reach. And if he reaches this man, he'll bring peace to Israel for an entire generation. Peace with their greatest enemy for an entire generation. But he doesn't have one single, one God law-keeping Jew anywhere near the man who can witness to him. So he looks to that north country and says, I've got to find somebody who I can shatter their dreams and destroy their life and rip them away from their family and take them away from everybody they know and everything they know and they'll still have a good enough attitude when they get to him to represent me and here this woman is she looked right at him and said I would to God that my master was in some areas for there was a prophet of the Lord there who would heal him and God brought peace to two nations he healed a leper in a famous story but it's because one young woman who had lost everything spoke up I want you to think about the calamity in your life. Have you ever asked yourself, what can Jesus get out of this? What can Jesus do with this? I know what time it is. Let, let's stand. I was thinking about Brother Samuel Van Slyke. Godly man who attended the church we pastored in Orangefield. A good man. He had been a chain smoker for years before he came to the Lord. He had done lung damage before he came to the Lord. And. He watched after he jumped in with both feet, man. He fell in love with Jesus. 
my first service as pastor there, I showed up an hour early and he was already on the back row praying. He had wheeled his oxygen tank in and found the corner. And God had healed him of one thing after another, but he never healed his lungs. And one day when things were getting really tough for him, I walked into his hospital room. Now this guy wrote gospel tracts and everybody, every home health care provider, every doctor, every nurse, every cleaning lady, everybody who walked within six feet of him had to hear about the Spirit of God. And I watched him weak and frail up on one elbow looking at this sweet nurse. He said, you know what? God may have let me suffer this entire affliction just to put me in a room with you so you could hear about how wonderful he is and how desperately you need him. And if you'll listen to what I'm saying and give him a chance, whether I live or die won't matter. It'll have been worth it. And I knew him well enough to know he meant every word of it. Tears welled up in my eyes and I wondered how many opportunities have I prayed and complained my way out of? Because all I could see was the inconvenience. And all I could see was the valley. Sometimes my predicament has nothing to do with me. Sometimes my predicament has everything to do with Him. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And if we'll stop trying to fulfill our own whims and wishes and give our life to His purpose, He may very well boggle our minds. I've told you the story. I try to tell it every year. I've probably told it seven times in the last nine. As frustrated as I've ever been. Everything went wrong at my store. Everything went wrong. Running way late for church. Engaged to a woman. I'm now married to her. Trying to get there to see her. And I realized later that the Lord wreaked hours of havoc on my life to have me standing at the right gas pump the right moment in front of the right man the man he seemed so old at the time he was like 45 he looks younger now he had been away from the Lord for 15 years But I found myself at the gas pump next to his, saw his alumni sticker, struck up a conversation. What are you doing here? Well, I'm doing this. What are you doing here? He said, where are you going tonight? I said, I'm on my way to church. He said, what kind? I said, it's an apostolic church. He said, I used to go to a church like that. Out came his story. I said, why don't you come with me right now? He said, I can't. I've got to drive all night and get back home, but I'm going to go when I get there. I said, can I pray with you before we leave? He stuck his clenched fist out. I was 18 years old. I just took him by the wrist and began to pray. And the presence of God filled that parking lot. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And before it's over, this weeping, snotty-nosed man grabbed me and hugged me like he had known me all of my life. We wept and we rejoiced. When it was over and he stepped back, I looked up and nobody had come out of the service station. They were all inside. And when I walked in, they parted like the Red Sea. I could have paid the cashier with Monopoly money. She wouldn't make eye contact with me. I got back in the car to leave. And all I could think about, I complain because trucks run late. I complain because employees had to leave early. I complained while I unloaded a truck all by myself, basically. Complain because it ruined my church clothes and I had to go back home. I was UPS brown from head to toe. 
I complain because I'm single and I was too lazy to keep two sets of dress clothes ironed. I ironed whatever I was wearing. Then I complained because somehow I was out of gas. I had been miserable all day long, but God knew exactly what He was doing, that He could bring about an expected end. And He didn't do any of that for me. He did it all for somebody else. Can I ask you a question? When you pray and live your life, do you see yourself as the means of anybody else's miracle or are they all about you? Is this all about I want and I need and I desire and I think? Have you ever given your life to His purpose? Just given your life to His desires? God, you can elevate me. You can demote me. I just want to be in the middle of what you're doing. You can use me here or there. I just want to be in the middle of what you're doing. I'm not after this. I'm not after that. God, I'm just after you. I'm after you. I know know that this befallen me has surprised you what can I do for you in Jesus name the eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth that's why fishermen get in the middle of the pond and cast against the bank and the fishermen on the bank cast in the middle of the pond because we all believe the big stuff somewhere else it's right where he put you He'll use you right where you are. Oh, oh, right now I wonder, can we just find a place and talk to Him about His purpose? God, what's your purpose? I'm not talking about what I want, but God, what do you want? I'm not telling you what I think, Lord. I'm asking you, what, what, what are your thoughts? What are your desires? What's your intent? What's your purpose? What would you have me 